Woodworking is not just about cutting stock to size and gluing it together. In all the years that I've worked with wood, the most rewarding times have been creating tools or jigs to accomplish tasks that wouldn't be possible with the tool straight out of the box. This gives an entirely different dimension to this craft and allows us to find solutions through problem solving. Solving those problems I've found can be more rewarding than the project's conclusion. In the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you some of the materials I use when I need to create jigs or fixtures. Like my last full-size tip video, I've indexed each of the tips so that you can easily move on if you've already seen the tip. I've also got links you'll find in the description that go along with the video. Let's roll. There's a flame that burns inside myself. It's easy enough to cut runners for miter slots, but when you need runners to lock in place, you could go the expensive route and buy expansion bars, but I've found that they slip, and yeah, they're expensive. Instead, I like to make my own for my jigs. I'll cut a piece of stock that's just as thick as my miter slot. Next, I use a ruler and find the center of the stock piece. We'll use the brad point bit that's the size of the bolt we'll use for our knob, and then a countersink bit that our taper bolt will fit into. Now I'll add a couple holes that are an inch or so from the center hole and drill both out at a quarter inch. To make an expansion slot, we'll use a coping saw to connect both holes. You could just use a cone-shaped bolt at this point, but they can slip. Instead, I turn to my secret weapon. If you can't find a cone-shaped slot head bolt, you can use a hacksaw to cut a gap in a Phillips bolt. Then I add a cotter pin, cutting the loop off. While you could use epoxy to hold it in, I found that hot glue works just as well. Now, I slide it into the slot and tighten it down. I think you'd be surprised by how well they are at locking jigs in place. One of the most important fasteners you'll want to master is the T-nut. With the T-nut, you're able to create a link between steel threading and the actual jig you create from wood. You might be tempted to think that due to the spiked tines, all you need to do is cut a center hole out and hammer it in. The problem, as you can see here, is that the splines can deform and become weak. A better method is to start with the Forzner bit, drill down the depth of the flange thickness, and then drill the barrel thickness out with a brad point bit. Place the barrel of the T-nut in the hole you drilled and give it a few taps. Drill a hole slightly smaller than the tines in each of the marks that were made. To attach it, you can either use epoxy around the tines, the barrel, and the underside of the flange, or you can add a few screws through the top. Another consideration when adding these is the pressure that you put on them. It is far better to create pressure with the T-nut pressed into the wood than away from the wood. If I'm making a knob, I would want to put the locking pressure pulling the T-nut into the knob, then away from or just on the surface. Butt hinges or bottom hinges sorry, mom. are two pieces of metal that butt up against each other and hinge on a pin that floats between a set of knuckles. While butt hinges are the most common hinges in the world, they are oftentimes not used correctly. Mounting this type of hinge open can create a lot of stress on the plates, causing them to deform. Also, the strength of a butt hinge relies on each of the metal pieces to be recessed into the material they're attached to. This takes the weight off the screws on each of the plates and places it inside the actual door. Having said that, there are times when that rule can be broken. Used in a jig, it can be a great way to keep two sections together. You'll need a hinge with a removable pin and a cotter pin. Screw the hinge on open and slide the pin in. It's a great hack. Piano hinges? Okay, yes. You'll find them on pianos. Beyond the name, piano hinges are some of the very best hinges you can slap onto a project. We talked about butt hinges back in 64 as being the most used hinges in the world. Now we'll talk about what I consider to be the strongest hinges you can buy. Piano hinges, which are long conjoining metal plates that hinge on a central pin, might open and close like the butt hinge, but that's where the similarities end. Unlike the butt hinge that relies on recessed cuts in the materials that they're attached to, these hinges can simply be attached to two surfaces. This makes them far easier to install. Also, because each piano hinge acts like a small army of butt hinges, they are ideal for weight loads as well as having precise movement with very little play. This makes them far better for jigs that need to have the greatest accuracy as well as excellent cabinet doors where hanging weight is an issue. These hidden cabinet doors in my wall hold all types of heavy tools and have never sagged. If you're looking for unmatched strength and precision, you've got to use a piano hinge. Hanger bolts, like the T-nut, are an excellent way to link steel to wood when making jigs. A hanger bolt has a machine threaded end that you can thread a nut on and a wood screw end that easily screws into wood stock. To install it, we'll take the wood screw end and find a drill bit that's the size of the shaft. I'll place a drill bit over the screw and check to see if I can still see the threading. Now, I'll add my hole with the bit. You can dip the screw into epoxy if you're attaching this into plywood or particle board, but it shouldn't be needed with soft or hard wood. Before you grab a pair of pliers and chew up the machine threaded end, grab two nuts and jam them together with a couple pair of wrenches. Once things are tight, we'll use a wrench on the nut farthest away from the wood threaded screw end and twist it in. These are great if you're looking to tighten something onto the bolt end like a knob, but should not be used as a studded knob. To put it simply, the wood screw should never be twisted. A nut should only be screwed and tightened onto the bolt end. 
If I'm looking to measure things with my jigs, I have a few go-tos. For small jigs, you can't beat these little steel measuring rulers. For a few dollars, you get a ruler that gets you within a 64th of an inch. I've used these on bandsaw jigs, thin strip jigs, table saw blade height jigs, and marking gauges. They're precise and unlike most rulers, the measurements reach the end of the stick, which makes them perfect for jigs. If I'm looking for a longer measurement, I go with these sticky measuring tapes. They're great if you're looking to replace the measuring ruler on your table saw for miter saws, sleds for both table and bandsaw jigs, as well as adding a tape to your bench for quick measurements. And finally, if you're looking for a temporary or sacrificial tape to add, you can pick up a roll of this tape that has 12 inch segments. It's great to add to any table when you're cutting precise pieces. When you're done, peel it off and throw it away. Jig making will at times require sliding and locking items in place. T-tracks are a great way to do that. Here's a quick guide to these incredibly versatile tracks. Tracks can be sold with or without countersunk screw holes. This can be really useful or unnecessary depending on the thickness of your stock. Flathead screws are always the better option, but epoxy can be used if you're attaching them in thin stock like plywood. If you're going to use epoxy, watch for T-tracks with these textured outer walls, which will make gluing stronger. Add an oversized dowel and a couple clamps to glue them in. Pay attention to the height of the tracks. Lower profile tracks have been far more helpful for me as they can be put in three quarter inch plywood. Lower profile tracks don't work with regular hex nuts, but you can use thinner jam nuts. T-tracks can be purchased in any length you're looking for and can be cut to length with carbide blades like a table saw blade. Check online before you buy them as you can find good deals on eBay and Amazon. T-track bolts are great when you have them nearby. If you don't want to order them, go to a plumbing department and look for Johnny bolts, which are used for toilets. If tracks aren't pre-drilled, some tracks have these slots down the middle, which makes adding holes easier later on. Too many times I've seen projects where a nut needs to be inlaid. The jig maker traces the perimeter of the hex nut and goes to work chiseling it out. But if you're going to take the time to inlay a fixed nut into a project or jig, the much easier and stronger solution is to use a square nut. Square nuts are by and large far more superior to hex nuts and tend to not strip due to the wider surfaces, which is incredibly important when inlaying into wood. Hex nuts only advantage over square nuts is a faster and easier install as there are more angles to use when tightening down, something that's not at all needed with inlaid nuts. To inlay a nut, we'll find the square nut we're looking for and measure to find the width. Now we'll take the measurement and find a drill bit that closely corresponds and drill our depth out, something you would never want to do with a hex nut. We'll take our nut and place it over the hole and mark our corners. Now all you need is a thin chisel and you only have to cut out the 90s at each edge to finish. Something far more easier than trying to tackle each of the six sides of a hex nut. The only downfall to using square nuts is the cost. Because they're not the industry standard, you're going to pay more, but it's a little more money that's worth it for an easier and better inlay. A toggle clamp is an excellent way to quickly and temporarily clamp things down. My favorite application for these clamps is to hold things down on my table saw for making cuts. But the truth is, these clamps, unless used in a position where the clamping pad and bolt are permanently fixed, are flawed. The normal usage for these goes like this. Two nuts are loosened with a pair of wrenches and the bolt is lowered. After realigning two steel plates, both nuts are tightened up again and your clamp is ready for use. This method is perfect for clamping my router to my router plane as it never needs to be adjusted. But if I'm going to use a toggle clamp for holding stock, the bolt with the clamping pad will need to be adjusted each time for different thicknesses, which means the process of loosening and tightening with wrenches needs to be started again. But we can fix this by cutting a groove. I'll insert the nut and now can turn the bolt into the position that I want. Because of the loops on the clamp and the nut, the bolt will be locked in, so you really don't need epoxy. If you're interested in how I made my table saw lockdown clamp, I have a link in the description below. By and far my favorite go-to for adding channel jigs is by adding aluminum T-tracks. They're strong, durable, and they're easy to add. But there are times when making my own tracks has been a better solution. When I made my sliding dovetail track for my table saw sled, I opted to create a dovetail sliding arm as it limited movement. To create it, I used my blade set at a 45 degree angle. I chose a piece of solid wood and cut in from both sides. The arm that went into the channel was created by switching the fence to the opposite side of the blade and cutting again. For the full build of that, I've got a link in the description below. A second wooden track that mimics the aluminum T-track can be made very easily. We'll cut a U-slot and a piece of stock and lower the blade, cutting half of one of the outside walls. Now we'll cut the stock to size and then in half, gluing the track to finish. Whichever wooden track you choose to make, remember that these will be much more limited in strength, so using a hardwood like Jatoba or Oak will be your best strategy. 
When making tools or jigs, you can't go wrong with having a set of rare earth magnets on hand. I use them so much that I've got my own storage container for them. Besides the obvious tool storage on the side of my machines, they're great for creating resistance or for attaching jigs. With my marking tool that uses a square steel rod, a block of wood, and a piece of graphite, I added a rare earth magnet that creates resistance, preventing my jig from sliding after I've set it to the right size. With my bandsaw jig, I use it to give me a little more holding power when I add my circular cutting jig. It's a little more strength that works with a thumb knob to keep things lined up. To attach these guys, there are a few options. Like my marking gauge, you can trap it between a couple pieces of wood. Two-part epoxy works as well to lock it in place. Another option is to buy rare earth magnets that have pre-drilled holes in the center of them, allowing you to add a screw to hold them in place. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you found something in this video that can help you in your workshop. If you did, leave a comment below and let me know what you found. A really big thank you to my patrons that helped tighten the nuts and bolts in the shop. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, Tudor the Barbarian, Mike Laurinaitis, Les N, and Gary G. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob. And remember to keep making things.